Well, good morning, everyone. Um, a couple of sort of just housekeeping things. Uh, as you'll see, I've got a presentation. That means that I can only see a very small selection of those of you who are watching. Um, but can I ask that you turn your, your systems to mute, simply so that if you have a, mo a, a mobile phone go off or something else, that doesn't disturb other people. Um, because we're on Zoom, it's very difficult then for me to see if you wanted to interject with a question. So what I'll try and do is rattle through these slides fairly quickly. There's quite a lot of detail on some of them, which I won't go into. You can sort of read it and listen as well. And then if there's a particular question you have, um, if we can come back to them briefly at the end before we move into a, a discussion that Roger will chair, which is a, a guild related discussion. Uh, then I think that's the easiest way to deal with with any questions that you have and hopefully as I explain along the way you'll get most of the gist of of, of the subject matter but it's it's super to have you uh, uh, along this morning and, and certainly a, a new experience for me to be giving a presentation um, by zoom I've led a few house groups and things um, but this is a slightly different thing so uh, hopefully the technology will hold up apologies if we have any snags along the way. Um, obviously, the first thing is to what, it, what area are we talking about? And obviously, the two dioceses of Winchester and Portsmouth cover the vast majority of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, but not all of Hampshire. There's an area around Aldershot and up towards Farnham that is in the Diocese of Guildford. And, and in 1927, when the Diocese of Guildford and the Diocese of Portsmouth were formed, um, the Guildford Ringers decided to create their own guild. So they moved away. And obviously, Originally, the Diocese of Winchester extended right through Surrey and up to what is now the Diocese of Southwark. But you'll see at the other end, there are areas which are now technically in Dorset, but we're talking, if you like, about most of the historic county of Hampshire. Um, the two dioceses, the whole area has had a long association with bells. There are lots of records of bells in um, Winchester Cathedral and, and, and Romsey Abbey um, and records back before uh, before the conquest, uh, King Canute died in 1035. So if he gave two bells to the the New Minster, then they must have been they must have dated from before 1035. There's information about ringing and a, a weather vane falling down, instructions to the monks in 1334, and similarly at Romsey Abbey when when it says bells to be rung for the hours, this is the the canonical hours which indicated the various services and praises that had to be sung through the day by the nuns at Romsey Abbey. So clearly there was a, there was a need to, to tell the, the town people of Romsey and also um, those that were working around the Abbey that, that a service was about to start. And, and the whole point of those in those days, of course, was that bells, there may have been several bells hung in a tower, but they were used for different purposes for a curfew, a, a worship bell, a, a sanctus bell to be rung when the, the elements of the communion were, were raised to give praise um, to God as part of the communion service, um, but also they were chimed together in a, in a glorious clang, as we often hear on the continent, when bells are swung together, but not particularly in any sequence. Uh, and that was for festivals and special occasions of which there were many in medieval times. And if we go back to the early records, um, bell founders were described as billeters or belletaires, um, relating to bell founding or braziers of uh, brazotas relating to brass founders. And often um, in those days, they founded using a, a variety of metals. They weren't just bell founders. The history of our bells and our bells go back over 900 years in this county, bells that we still have in existence, comes from a variety of sources, from archeological information, from a whole range of documentary records. And if you go down that list, sadly, we don't have an inventory of 15, the 1550s which has been transcribed. There is one in the, uh, the National Record Office, the National Archives, uh, but it hasn't been transcribed. In some county books, you will find for each church it's listed, um, there's a record of, of the number of bells that were in the church tower in the 1550s when uh, a, an inventory was undertaken of church goods. Um, so that's a piece of research that somebody might want to take on one day to, to go through those records at the National Archives uh, and to transcribe them. And it would be quite interesting to, to, to understand, perhaps in some cases, bells that, that still exist today that were recorded in that inventory. 
Um, the other thing, the National Bell Register, which is part of the work of Dove's Guide, um, started by John Baldwin and others and, and gradually developing, um, which also comes off the back of um, county and diocesan records from the Church Buildings Council, which are part of their national record. So there's some important work going on there to, to gather together um, some of our historical knowledge about bells. The other thing that we have is many of these county books, and I'll just hold a couple up that you can see there. Um, a variety of people, particularly in the early part of the last century, produced county books. The one for Hampshire is dated to 1920. Uh, everybody talks about Colchester when they mean um, the, the church bells of Hampshire, Hampshire bells. So it's, a, it's 101 years old, unfortunately. It's, it's, not the most, and it's not the most accurate document as we've discovered over the years. Um, Walters um, produced a book on Wiltshire in 1929. George Elphick, a very, very highly respected bell historian um, and campanologist in the true sense of the word, someone who studied bells and their founding, um, produced a book on Sussex and, a, and an even more important volume on the craft of the bell founder in 1988, which is an important reference to how early bells were cast. And there are various others around Bolton's bell Bell's book for Dorset in 2000-2007 actually includes information of a lot of the bells in our diocese that are now in the in the modern county of Dorset so that's a, a much more up-to-date record and the, the Guild published a book by David Reverend David Corley in 2007 in which he updated Fred Sharp's the late Fred Sharp's book on the Channel Islands and uh, an important source of reference these days is Christopher Pickford who is um, among others, considered to be a very knowledgeable mem uh, member of the fraternity who deal with the history of bells. And of course, the other important resource we've got are bells that still exist today, including very ancient bells. Um, the archaeological evidence, just to deal with that briefly, goes back to excavations both at Romsey and at Winchester. Um, the, the excavations at Romsey indicate that, that whatever was going on in terms of, of bell mold activity, bell activity, um, from fragments of the loam that was used to mould the bells, and that's the top right-hand picture, um, is underneath a piece of the abbey that was built in 1120. So it's obviously um, earlier than 1120 and quite possibly Anglo-Saxon. Um, similarly, in Winchester Cathedral excavations around the outlines of the old minster and the new minster, the, the Saxon um, uh, cathedrals, if you like, indicated some, again, some bell material, some bell mould material, um, and that contained quite a lot of organic material uh, from the straw and the various other organic elements that were included in the loam that was used to, to, to mold the bells. And that organic material can be carbon dated. And so again, it's giving an indication, um, possibly very likely of pre-Saxon, uh, pre, sorry, pre-Norman work, so Saxon work. So that's quite a, a, an important backdating of, of, of when bell founding began in, in our area. And I say bell founding began in our area, and we'll see in a moment, that's actually quite a rare thing. Um, we've got bells of all shapes and sizes, from very early bells with very flat bottoms, if you like, flat rims, um, through rather elegant uh, third, 14th century bells, um, 17th century bells with very high crowns, um, very modern flat top bells in the sort of style we would expect from any of the major bell founders these days. And of course, they're hung in a variety of towers, uh, what we could call the great towers of the two dioceses and the small ones. And, and the thing for bell historians and for, for bell advisors particularly is, uh, as a bell advisor to a diocese, we have as much concern for these single ones and twos, small bells in, in, in unusual places as we do for the, the great rings. And so that introduces us to a whole range of interesting challenges about access, about recording, about maintenance and repair. So quite a variety of uh, different locations for our bell heritage. And the key thing is, okay, so as a bell historian, you want to know where they came from, who cast them. Um, we know that the earliest bells were often cast in situ in, the, in or near the church or around the church or in the village or whatever, um, local because of transport issues. But um, there obviously were bells that were brought in from outside. We, we know that there was never any major bell foundry in Hampshire. And so the vast majority of our bells will, will have come from founders who were operating outside the county. There's a possibility that some of our early bells may have come from France um, because there are a number of churches in the Southampton area 
dedicated to St. Denis, who was a French saint, or Saint Denis, if you prefer in the French. Um, we also know that by the 14th century, there were some established bell foundries in London. Um, the, the Wimbish dynasty of uh, from 12, 1290 and, and the London craft guilds included a whole area of um, a group of bell founders, often operating in what's now known as Billiter Street in the East End. So Billiter, Bell Founder. So um, th there were active bell foundries, static bell foundries. But for us, the two important bell foundries in the in the early Middle Ages were the Wokingham foundry, which started life at Chertsey Abbey, for which we have bells from around 1370, and the, the medieval Salisbury bell foundry, from which we have bells from about 1375. Having said that, our oldest surviving bells, the top two from Chilworth, are literally a mile and a half from where I'm sitting, so um, very, very local to me. Um, there's a possibility they've come from France because Chilworth Church is dedicated to Dennis, or Saint-Denis, um, and they've been dated by George Elphick, the late George Elphick, to that period of 1100 to 1125. So, so they're 900 years old, plus or minus a couple of years. Um, they are a different note, although they look the same size, and we'll understand that in a moment, how that comes about. And they're very conical in shape. They've got a very angular, flat bottom, if you like, rather than a rim or a lip or a sound bow. Um, the other two places that we have early bells, Appleshaw, uh, sorry, Mattingly, Appleshaw, um, th those are early bells as well, but a little bit later on. And again, very close to, uh, um, to, to Chilworth at North Badsley, again, perhaps a mile, mile and a half in the other direction from me, is, is a slightly later bell, but still from the 1200s uh, at, North, uh, at North Badsley. So these are bells, small numbers of bells generally. Um, but because they're in, in little out of the way places, they've survived all sorts of rigours of, of uh, time and, and activity in churches. Although obviously they're not hung on their original fittings, as can be seen from the top two pictures, which are very much early 20th century fittings. How were they made? They were made using what's called the lost wax process, um, cire perdu the, from the French, and there's a picture of how this happened in a stained glass window at York Minster. Um, and you can see there, you can see a, a pair of trestles with a bell underneath each, quite long waisted bells, a little more, uh, more bell shaped than the, the ones that we were looking at from Chilworth. Um, on, on a, and, and the bell is being molded on a horizontal um, beam or, or spit, if you like, almost like a, a medieval roasting spit. And you can see one of the workers there is cradling what looks like an upside down shepherd's crook. And that's called a crook. And that was used to help mold the, the, the mold and, and the bell. And so how was that happened? Well, you created this system with a um, typically a tapered beam or, um, a, a, or bar uh, revolving on two trestles. You mold it, you, you waxed it, or you covered it with grease so that you could remove it later. And you covered that with a loam, a mixture of um, founders clay, sand and loamy clay, um, and organic material, manure, uh, straw, uh, goat's hair, things of that sort, which would, would bind it together. Uh, the material would have been quite wet, it would have been built up in layers and smooth using that crook. You then built a wax bell, you molded a wax bell with quite a heavy, sort of a heavy candle wax over the top of it. Not the whole bell, but basically the waist and, uh, and what we would now call the sound bow. And then you shape that again with your crook to get the shape you wanted. And then you overlaid that with another layer of your loam. And you bound that together with some metal hoops, rather like on the casks of a barrel. You then tip the whole thing upside down so that you could drive out the center um, stake, if you like, so that you had a hollow. And then you molded separately um, the cannons and the crown of the bell. It, again, uh, molded them, you left a hole at the top that you were going to pour the metal in eventually, and another vent to let the gases out and the air out when you assembled it. That went on the top of there. You put the whole thing together and put it down on the ground, or more likely in the bottom of a pit, which you would fill in as part of the, uh, when you went and got ready to cast. You'd light a fire, and that would melt out the wax out of the bottom, so there were drain holes at the bottom, and you were left with a hollow representing the shape of the bell. And you notice also the dark blue 
uh, stirrup is actually what the clapper is going to be hung from. That would have been wrought iron. That would be inserted into the top of the mold as the as the cannons and crane were placed on the top of the on the top of the, of the bell mold. And then you poured your metal in very carefully and very gently. 77% um, uh, copper, 23% tin, uh, no doubt in the early days with a fair amount of impurities. And eventually when you broke it all open, you had your bell. And that's basically the lost wax process. And that continued for many, many years. Um, uh, and in fact, still continues on the continent, although somewhat adapted in the way they do it. The earliest datable bells we've got are actually on the Isle of Wight. There are two bells at Thorley on the Isle of Wight. Um, they're both inscribed in what is known as Lombardic capitals, uh, Johannes Rector Ecclesiae et Wallerandus Trenchard. And we know that Wallerandus Trenchard was Lord of the Manor in that area uh, because he's mentioned in a fine roll of 20, uh, 1260. Um, he was fined for something or other in the local court. And we know that Johannes was rector in that area in that period. So we can date the bells quite precisely to between 1260 and 1285. Um, and, and, and so, they're, as I say, the earliest dated bells that we've got. <clears throat> How were they hung? Well, the Bay of Tapestry tells that they were hung in hands, they were just swung, but we assume these were very large handbells. But the earliest bells we believe were hung, if you notice in the picture in the centre, um, the, the, the hanging, hanging loop or cannon at the top, the centre one called the Argent, has got quite a big um, somewhat pear-shaped hole in it. And there is evidence that originally a beam would have been put through that hole um, and, and, the, and the bell would have been roped to the beam using the other cannons. And because of the shape of it, it would have been sufficiently um, fitted and tight to enable the bell to be swung. But it wasn't long before they started introducing more modern thinking in the terms of headstocks. And we still have headstocks today, of course, and the bells uh, initially roped, but no doubt later, as we can see here, nailed on with metal bands called shear bands. A couple of spikes driven in the two ends of the of the wooden block, a lever put on them, and the whole thing hung between the, the beams and the timbers of a of a tower or structure. Or alternatively, we can see in the bottom left hand corner, um, a, a, a Norman church at Ashley up near King Somborne, where two bells are still hung in two bell openings. Um, the clapper attached either by literally having a hook on the top of it or some sort of leather strap between the, the, the crown staple, the hanging loop in the bell uh, and, and the stirrup top of the clapper. Um, just as long as the clapper swung and struck the bell somewhere near the, near the mouth, that was all that mattered. And over time, gradually, those timber structures evolved into things that looked a bit like the medieval roof trusses in the churches, um, what we call a braced king post frame built probably by the same carpenter that built the uh, uh, built built the church roof. Generally, as we've seen, bells were somewhat conical uh, in shape in the 12th century. If you wanted to have bells of different notes, you used the same molding uh, and framework, um, but you just thickened the bell. And if you increase the bell by a certain thickness, you could create a bell around about an octave uh, sharper, an octave higher in tone, thicker bells of the same diameter uh, have a higher note. Or a tenor, you could make, you could use a slightly smaller beam in the center and you could reduce the core diameter um, and use the same amount of wax. But as you can see, there were, there were problems. Either you ended up with a, a, a treble bell that was heavier and overpowered the, 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 the thinner bell with the lower note or alternatively you had a bell which sounded very weak by comparison. And it wasn't long before experimentation by bell founders created what we could call a more modern shape, the, the Thorley bells, as you can see, look relatively uh, sort of the bells we would expect today, but quite long waisted. Um, and gradually as time progressed um, into the 15th century, then the bell waist shortened somewhat, the cannons became chunkier, uh, and increasingly founders were looking to cast multiple bells for a ring, often in minor scales. And a lot of the rings of three that we have that date back to to the 15th century and thereabouts and earlier are the first three of a ring of five or bells two to four of a ring of six. They're unusual, unusual tuning. But some of these longer waisted bells actually enabled the bell founders to, to get to what we would call more or less modern harmonic tuning, five tone tuning. 
not by accident, but by the design of the profile, they, they'd begun to, to realize that. And they obviously had very good ears to hear how the bell would sound. And there's a classic example at Weald over near um, Alsford, where there's a Roger Landon bell, which is it's actually a, a maiden bell. It's never been tuned and it's basically five tone uh, modern tuning to in its tone and sound. <clears throat> These pre-Reformation bells, particularly in the period from 1350 to the Reformation about 1535 generally came from two foundries, from Wokingham and from Salisbury. They were imported into the county. As we'll see in a moment, there are a few bells from the London area, but Wokingham and Salisbury particularly were the main sources of our pre-Reformation bells. The Wokingham foundry, as I said, started with, bell, with a fraternity of founders based at Chertsey Abbey. Some may have been monks, some may have been lay workers, but after a while, that foundry moved to Wokingham, not the sort of place you would immediately associate with heavy industry, but obviously in the Middle Ages it was. Wokingham bells, early Wokingham bells, <coughs> identified particularly by this lion's head that you can see in the, in, in the top graphic there, and by the impression of a groat. I, from memory, it's Edward I, but I might have got the, the Edward wrong, but it's one of the King Edwards of that period, uh, impressed into the, into the wax of the moulding. Um, the earliest bell that we can identify to a founder is, again, connected with Wokingham, is at Rotherwick, the third of the current Ring of Six from about 1370. And that comes from someone who can be identified as Stephen Norton, who we know was also based in London for a time. And when we talk about an itinerant bell founder, it would basically mean somebody who acted rather like a tinker and went around from place to place with a set of basic kit and cast you a bell, um, had a bit of extra metal, but he broke up the bell that you wanted recast reused the metal, added a bit more, uh, and so he went on. And if he could cast a slightly smaller bell, then obviously he ended up with a bit of surplus metal at the end to use on another, on another day. Um, from 1380 to 1400, we've got 11 bells, <coughs> including the earliest Wokingham bell with an inscription, that's Sherborne St. John, the, the current fourth of six. Um, most bells in, in pre-Reformation times would have had some sort of religious inscription, Ave Maria, Ave Maria, Ora Pro Nobis, uh, Hail Mary, pray for us, things of this sort. So they were very much in that sort of Catholic tradition. And when we talk about crowned capitals, there are two examples there where the capital letter has, a, has a, a, an outline of a crown above it to perhaps amplify its importance as, as, a, 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 as part of that, uh, that inscription. Um, in the period after 1400, we start to get um, bells with what are called black letter inscriptions, sometimes again using crown capitals at the start of each word. We think black letter, which came from the continent as a, as a printing style, um, was introduced about 1420, but it may have been a bit earlier. And we've got 22 bells from Wokingham in that period. The first Wokingham founder we can actually put a name to is Roger Landon, and he was the first one to use what we could call a personal trademark. You can see the shield there has got RL for Roger Landon and underneath the bell a W for Wokingham. And Landon was succeeded by a, goal boy, uh, sorry, a guy called John Mitchell who cast a bell for Warblington. And when I say this is what they cast, this is what survives. Clearly they may have cast lots of other bells that haven't survived that we don't know about. So we're only talking about bells that we can identify to these founders. But even so, 45 bells in that period from one bell foundry that have survived uh, or, or that we can say survived as recently that they are in, in relatively modern records is still quite a prolific output um, from bells that are going back 600 years or so. In 1493 the bell foundry at Wokingham split uh, and a new foundry or a new branch was opened at Reading under a guy called William Hazelwood but the w Wokingham foundry continued under Folk Mitchell. There seems to have been a bit of a hiatus for about six or seven years, uh, but then it restarted again. We've got five bells from William Hazelwood, including um, the, the, the treble at St Matthew's Week in Winchester, which is the older of the two churches in Week, little church at the bottom of the hill as you go out towards Stockbridge. Uh, that's got um, Hazelwood's classic upside down W trademark. Um, it's also got a, 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 an inscription in black letter with Lombardic capitals, an interesting mix of lettering. We think Hazelwood was followed by a John Hazelwood who may have been his son, but we don't have any bells and much detail of him. But we have five bells from that, that founder's successor, John White, who was casting up to 1540. And his 
only pre-Reformation bell in, in our diocese is St. Barnabas, which is the modern church in Week in Winchester, which is actually hung outside, as you can see, and chimed with an internal uh, chiming hammer, an electronic chiming hammer. It was originally the second of three at St. Peter's in Chesley, Winchester, and when that church was closed, the bells were distributed uh, and Week got one of them. The working and foundry continued at, at a much lower level in terms of bells that we have, um, but Folk Mitchell did produce what we believe is the oldest complete ring of three by one founder for North Hailing in about 1530. Um, these bells are hung in, in one of those braced king post triangular frames. They're hung for what's called dead rope ringing, so they don't ring technically full circle. They've got um, half or three quarter wheels, half wheels, I think, um, and they can be swung more or less frame high, but not really controlled um, for change ringing in any way. By contrast, the medieval Salisbury foundry, either its bells weren't as robust and haven't survived, or it had much less impact on uh, activities in our diocese. So we've only got six bells in the period uh, 1350 to 1399. There are a possibility of another three, and you've got a picture of one of them there. That's actually my parish church here at Valley Park. Um, we thought it was Victorian, but uh, Chris Pickford has identified it as around about 1380. We know that there's another bell of almost identical shape and size at Bossington in the Tess Valley. And West Titherley Treble, which for a long time was thought to be about 1260 because of its apparent shape um, and, and therefore the oldest change ringing bell in existence. Um, one of the bell founders who's had some work there believes that actually its shape comes as a result of removing some of the lip to sharpen its tone that the bell is what's called skirted. And otherwise it's got the molding wires and the shape very similar to the, the bell in the picture. So it may well have come as part of that group and because of where they are, they may have come from Salisbury, but we can't be sure. We do know that there was a founder called John Barber in Salisbury um, in that period, 1399-1404. We've got one bell from him and we've also got um, the third uh, 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 of the bells at Hamble uh, from a guy called Richard Brazier of Wickham. And we know about him because he's recorded in Winchester College records as also having cast some bells um, for the college. Um, we're not absolutely sure when the college chapel was built in the 1393-1400 period, 1400 period. Um, but the bell, which is not used, may be a bit later than that, but he's recorded as having done that. The date of the record in the, in the, in, in the college is actually 1413, but it may be a bit historical. But Salisbury Foundry also sent four bells to Gatcombe on the Isle of Wight um, around 1450, and they may be the next oldest on the Isle of Wight after Thorley, we think they are. We know about Henry Pinker, who was casting at the end of the 1400s. And we've got three bells from him. And then just before the Reformation, Roger Ellis of Salisbury sent a bell to, provided a bell to Bramley, which has since been recast right up in the north of the county. And as I say, there's one or two bells from London and elsewhere. And you can see from that list, six from London, three from elsewhere, one of which may have come from, sorry, two of which may have come from Winchester and been cast at a, at a small, perhaps temporary foundry by a founder we only know by the name of R or perhaps RW. Um, quite a rare thing to, to be able to identify something that may have been cast locally. And the other, perhaps because of the importance of Christchurch Priory and its influence, came from Toddington in Bedfordshire from John Rufford. Rufford. So there's this sense of which sometimes if you were a really important church, you could command a bell founder. We think Rufford was, was actually bell founder to the, to the kings at the time and therefore may well have, have been well known in, in bell founding circles as the sort of royal bell founder. Um, in the next 50 years, only four bells from London. Um, and, and if you note the one from John Sturdy at Southwark, um, we'll mention his family again in a moment. One bell from the medieval Gloucester foundry, which was a very famous and prolific foundry, but only one bell survives from there that we know of. Um, and four that we can't place, but we know the date is about 1450. And mentioning the Sturdies in the 1450-1530, that, that sort of 80 years immediately before the Reformation, um, we've got a bell from Joanna Sturdy. Now, this is the wife of John Sturdy. Being a bell founder could be quite a dangerous process. Um, bells could explode on casting. Um, you could be scalded with, with metal. You could, all sorts of things could happen, as well as the fact that life generally in the 1400s wasn't, life expectancy wasn't huge. 
But Joanna Sturdy actually took on the foundry from her husband and continued it for about uh, six or seven years. For, sorry, uh, four, three or four years, sorry. Um, and, and we know that in around 1460, she cast the second for St. John the Baptist in Winchester, <coughs> a bell sadly that can't be rung, uh, not, in a, not in a good condition. But we know it's his wife because she puts a little lozenge shape above his standard trademark to indicate that she's the wife of the, the male founder. And we also know that John Sturdy died in 1458 from his will for which there's a record. And then two other London founders, Danielle and Bullisden, who cast bells in, in relatively small numbers. And uh, John Tun, in, who was casting in Sussex, but may well have moved around the area, cast a couple of bells for us as well. By this time, by the sort of ref period of the Reformation, um, bells are getting big enough, it's not easy to put them onto a horizontal trestle. Uh, uh, so they were being cast round a core of, of brick or hard material with the loam built up round it, the loam then covered in a layer of wax and a bell of clay built over that, that layer of wax, which again was, was waxed again. The, the two shapes, the inside shape of the bell and the outside shape of the bell, molded around a, a, a post put down the centre, um, which I haven't shown in the diagrams. Um, they were called sweeps and there were two for each bell, one that marked the inside and one that, that shaped the outside and smoothed the wax over at the end. You then built a, an outer layer of mould, which had a couple of hooks underneath the, 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 the bottom edges, as you can see when you built that up. If you then lit a fire under it, you could melt the wax out. And that, when you lifted the, enabled you to lift the, the, the outer layer or cope off, you could then break up the bell inside it, the clay bell. You would separately again mould the, the cannons and the crown and fit them together, having taken your molding, often pieces of wood that you took out, you split it in half, you reassembled it. You can see there's a, a thin red line across the middle to enable you to, 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 to do the thing in two halves. And you assembled it all and you had a hollow that you could then pour your bell metal into. And that's how um, lost wax developed uh, around the clay bell method. Um, bell hanging had advanced to, uh, to a degree um, if you notice now, you're still using a couple of spikes for your gudgeons to pivot the bell, but to stop the ends of the headstock splitting, you've now got a couple of stock hoops that just cover the, a couple of bosses that hold the whole thing together. You've also got a U-link um, holding the bell more strongly to the, to the headstock as well as your nailed shear bands. And, and that U-link is held in with a couple of metal wedges called keys to, to stop it slipping. And they obviously had to be driven home at regular intervals as, as any shrinkage or movement caused a problem. We're moving from a lever to a half to a quarter and then a half wheel enabling the bell to be swung higher and also recognizing that in at this stage you need to, to make your clapper a more uh, sort of robust thing that, that only pivots in one place. Uh, in other words it pivots on the crown staple and so you've got this arrangement here of a of a C-link with a wooden spacer, a leather lining called a baldric, uh, takes its name from the strap that swords were hung from across the shoulder. Um, and then obviously some sort of stiffener, a piece of, 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 of timber uh, wedged in and, and lashed to the clapper. And the bell's now revolving not just in, in bare wood, but in a gunmetal, a brass, um, plain bearing of a sort that that you can still find plentifully in our belfries today. Um, these plain bearings were produced from the, the mid 1400s right down to the start of the 20th century really. Uh, and you're now getting multiple bells so you're having to hang them side by side in, in, in bell frames of again this brace trust form but, but holding them together and bracing them in a way that you can hang multiple bells side by side. And that brings us on to a particular connection between those three bell um, brace king post frames and Hampshire uh, and the Hampshire dovecot belfry of which these are just three random examples if you like I'm sorry they're all in the guises of Winchester but they're from historic photographs that I've had and, and one of the reasons that we've got lots of these wooden belfries is because we're a bit short on on stone for building there is stone but lots of it has to be imported because a lot of Hampshire is chalk, um, there is very little building chalk called clunch. There are little bits of it, but not a huge amount. 
So when churches were built, the expense of importing stone was really for the, the coins, the corners, the, the points at which you needed a solid uh, buildup of material. And a lot of the rest of the walls were built of flint rubble or knack flints. But we have quite a lot of timber because we had a number of, uh, certainly in the Middle Ages, a number of forests um, and, and forested areas. As I say, lots of flint. We also had lots of, of clay that could make tiles uh, and lots of, of arable land, so plenty of straw that could be used to produce um, the cob walls. And there are one or two churches that have got cob walls, but not a lot of building stone. So it was very convenient to use all this timber to build the, the, the typical dovecot belfry supported on four huge uprights, maybe cross beams, um, all cross braced with lovely angled braces down in the nave and your three bell frame neatly sat across it, swinging uh, across the west wall of the, of the church, across the strongest wall with the tenor usually swinging across uh, that strongest wall to give extra support. There were variations, but here is the sort of typical model with the four uprights. Uh, and there are a couple of examples there of where you can find those. But there were variations. Sometimes the frame extended out over the west wall. Sometimes the, the uprights didn't need to come to the ground. They were supported just on cross beams if the nave was narrow enough. Sometimes, as at Martyr Worthy, you had a bit of a combination of the two. So a, a pair of uprights into the church uh, and a pair of stone corbels against the west wall holding up the structure. Some towers were built um, surrounded by masonry separate from the church, so it, they don't, the, the tower doesn't rise in the church. And in the case of, of uh, Micklemersh, the tower is actually a timber clad tower outside uh, a timber frame of, of the talk we've just been looking at. And sometimes you had a masonry tower uh, and the timber structure sat on the top of it. But these are, are variations that we have. Um, because more bells are being cast together and because they're being swung higher, the stresses on them increased. And so the, 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 the bell founder's response was to make the bells shorter and squatter. And particularly as, as in the post-Reformation period, say from 1535 onwards, um, bells were increasingly being swung quite high. Um, the need for a stronger um, squatter bell was, was important and a, a much more robust set of cannons. Um, we also got the situation there where increasingly founders are beginning to use uh, trademarks to indicate who they are. Um, and we've got uh, bells being cast and, and tuned very simply by literally taking a hammer and a tuning chisel to, to the bell, sometimes tuning inside the same bow, sometimes, uh, and that would flatten the bell and flatten most of the partials to a degree, sometimes uh, literally chipping away at the rim. This is what we call skirting. And um, that sharpened the bell to a degree if it was a bit flat. So these were fairly crude methods of trying to bring bells sort of in, in tune with themselves, but also in tune with each other. Although, as I said earlier, not always in, in, in what we would call a, a major musical scale. Bell frames were evolving, again, to resist the tresses of bells swinging much higher. The short heads, of which, which the bell sat on, <coughs> were increasingly replaced with long heads. And bell frames, rather than being three bells in a row, were increasingly having to be adapted to accommodate more bells. So initially you've got, if you look at the bottom right hand side, a, what's called a swastika frame, four, four pits going round a, a central hollow, uh, one bell swinging in each direction. Um, in this case, actually, that's been adapted. One of the pits has been split in half to create an extra bell pit. Um, but these were gradual evolutions. They didn't happen everywhere. Some places needed work done, and that was an opportunity to introduce a new situation. Whereas we've still got a two or three of these brace king post frames that date back to the 1390s, 1400s, totally untouched. Um, and so if it didn't need to be altered, they weren't. Um, bell hanging also, we're now beginning to get a situation where rather than nailing everything to the headstock and having to renail it regularly, you've got increasing use of of what we might call medieval bolts with a with a rod with a, uh, a split in the top that you could drive a wedge through um, and a piece of metal through the cannons underneath uh, the headstock to hold the bell up. Uh, you also begin to get a situation where as secular ringing began to take over from sacred ringing, 
post-Reformation. Uh, the desire to swing bells higher and have more control over them led to the development of the three-quarter wheel. And of course, once the rope goes past the vertical, um, you need to have some sort of rope roller to stop up the, the bell, bell rope rubbing on the floor of the belfry. And this was, there's an example there, a very simple rope roller that was used in the, in the late 1500s, 1600s, and, and even in the 1700s in some towers. Uh, and that enabled this, this swinging on three quarter wheels enabled bells to be actually controlled to a degree where you could ring simple changes. Uh, and you've got a situation here now where uh, that meant that, that you didn't tend to move the heavy bells, which were quite heavy to move around. You tended to just move the small bells among them so that you minimize the effort. Because even then that the bell hanging wasn't, didn't make bells easy to ring by modern standards. A couple of examples here very quickly, I'm conscious time is moving on, of um, the, the evolution of ringing. Romsey Abbey, lots of evidence of, of bells at Romsey Abbey, possibly two sets of five, um, because there's a suggestion there was a, a tower attached to the North Isle, which was the, the parish church for many, many years. Um, and it's possible one set of five may have been sequestered at the suppression of the monasteries. But we know that the Abbey Campanile, which was to the north of, of Romsey Abbey, um, was, was demolished and the bells were transferred into a five bell frame in the central tower at Romsey Abbey and a ringing floor was installed underneath that, to, that, that installation. And we think this was a ring of five plus an extra bell, possibly a service bell or a curfew bell hung outside, but there aren't records to confirm that. And we think again, these were likely to have been hung on three quarter wheels. So there could have been some simple change ringing. And there again is, is, is uh, historical archaeological evidence of a bell being cast in the 17th century at King John's house, which is about 100 yards from Romsey Abbey. And of course, in 1791, these uh, heavy bells were traded in and a new ring of eight was cast at Whitechapel. Similarly, at Winchester Cathedral, where there were bells, as we've said, gifted before 1035, timber frame constructed for seven bells and a ringing chamber installed, floor installed in the 1630s um, and we know there were seven bells there were records in the in the in the cathedral records and again likely they were swing chimed interestingly these bells had latin inscriptions so it may be they were earlier bells that had been reinstalled in the cathedral in a new frame but in in uh, 1734 richard phelps of whitechapel uh, cast a heavy ring of six we think the tenor was about 3200 weight which would have been a big bell for that period um, and they appears they were hung in the original frame, this, this 1632 frame, which was somewhat hacked around and altered to fit the bells in. And the belief is that method ringing began then. And then you can see in the 17 and 1800s, the bells were recast and increased in weight. Wokingham continued post-Reformation, principally under the Eldridge family from 1565, from whom we have 11 bells, although um, the Eldridge family also opened uh, branches at Chertsey. Interesting, the Wokingham family, in a sense, went back to Chertsey. Um, and um, there were some bells that were sent by to, to, to the county um, from Chertsey. But the foundry closed at Wokingham in about 1674. Um, in parallel, the Reading branch continued under three known founders and two, um, if you like, foreman founders. Uh, in the 1600s. And you can see there we've got 18 bells cast in that uh, early post-Reformation period, really up until the up until the Civil War in the 1600s. And Salisbury, 67 bells, a little bit more prolific. The most prolific of all, um, John Wallace, 26 bells. Um, I haven't listed all of the sources here, but, but but we know that there were there were other odd bells from other founders we can't identify. But but certainly Wallace cast a significant proportion of them in that period at the end of the 1500s, beginning of the 1600s. Separate to the, the, the foundry that was a branch at Woke, of Wokingham at Reading, the Knight family uh, created a foundry of their own in 1518. And in the period of 1739, when Samuel Knight moved off to London, um, we have 97 bells surviving from the Knight family of, of Reading. So um, a, quite a prolific founder, although um, some of the early, uh, the, the two Williams, we've got relatively small numbers, but William the first Knight, as we call him, 
cast a complete three for Long Sutton in 1535. Uh, a number of itinerant founders, people moving around at the time. And as you can see, <clears throat> there's a possibility that were some bells cast in Romsey. We've already heard there's archaeological evidence. Someone either called Robert Beckinsall or Ralph Brooke, or certainly R. Beckinsall, 25 bells in our two dioceses, Anthony Bond, seven bells, some of which have been recast, and John Higdon, who was a foreman at Reading, who cast 23 bells that we still have, and a guy called Bartlett, who operated, it appears, in Portsmouth. So a, a number of different ones that, that were casting at that time. After 1660, for 150 years or so, the emphasis was much on secular ringing, and I don't get into the history of change ringing in terms of, of the politics of it, but what we've got in a founding sense is a gradual shift from creating threes to, to adding bells to make fours or fives to enable change ringing to take place. Bearing in mind we're in a really rural, relatively rural area still, so relatively few towns with rings of eight. And from that point, we get um, the continuation of the Whitechapel Bell Foundry, which dates back to four, dated back to 1420, um, the continuation of the Salisbury Foundry, um, some bells from the, the Ruddall Foundry in Gloucester, um, and we'll see in a minute the Oldbourne Foundry uh, uh, in Wiltshire that was established in 1694, uh, and from Catlin's Foundry at Holborn in London for a period in the early 1700s. All those founders from Salisbury down to 1737 provided us with 33 bells that survive. The, the famous Ruddall foundry in Gloucester provides us with, with 10 or more bells. We know that some have been recast and there is a suggestion that they cast some rings of bells. That we, we don't know the exact number that they cast because some bells have been recast. The Oldbourne Foundry, which was created in 1694, of course, just over the border in, in Wiltshire from, from northwest Hampshire. So unsurprisingly, a vast number of bells, including quite a number of complete rings. And you'll notice there that the most prolific founders in terms of casting bells for the, these two dioceses were the two Roberts between 1760 and 1793, uh, and then James Wells. Um, and the Wells family, who actually started life as farmers at Whittenditch, just uh, on the Hungerford side of, uh, of Oldbourne, um, they, they became bell founders. They took over from what had been the core family's foundry, which had then been run by basically foremen or uh, smaller operators, Stairs, Reed and, and Edney Witts. Uh, and the Wellses made a big business of it until they went sadly bankrupt in the 1820s and were bought out by the Mearses. In terms of Whitechapel, and again, I'm pressing on quite quickly because of the time, relatively few bells from Whitechapel before 1714 that have survived. Um, the key difference was Richard Phelps, who began to supply bells, and he supplied 19 that we know of um, after 1700. Um, and, uh, and the Whitechapel foundry 114 or more bells, uh, including uh, several rings, in the late 1700s, later 1700s and early 1800s, showing how change ringing was growing, how the demand for change ringing peels was growing. Again, a selection of smaller founders, perhaps the most prolific Hampshire founder that we've ever had, Joshua Kipling, that we can definitely say was casting bells in Portsmouth. He was a, trained in York at one of the famous York Bell foundries, moved to Portsmouth, married a Portsmouth girl, and cast at least 13 surviving bells um, that we have in, in the diocese. John Early, a very unusual brass founder, an agricultural founder, who cast one bell at Hunton. I've never heard it, but I, I guess it won't be particularly musical if he was a brass founder, a small bell. Um, Thomas Swain had a foundry at Longford in Middlesex and provided a, a ring of five for Stratfield Say and a ring of five for Upham. That, that's his contribution. Um, and Tom, uh, Thomas Bartlett, this isn't the Bartlett who was a Whitechapel founder, it's a different one, it seems cast a couple of bells in Portsmouth for Farlington. Uh, and as you can see, odd, odds and ends there. And interesting, the bottom one, William Dobson was a Downham Market founder in, in sort of Norfolk, Cambridgeshire area. Um, he was obviously a very good salesman. He cast a ring of bells for Poole just before the Bransgore Bell in 1822. 
And it appears that he shipped a lot of his bells by sea from the wash from Boston or Kings Lynn round the coast. And obviously going to Poole would have been very easy because Poole a natural harbour. So Dobson, a bit of a salesman, managed to sell a bell to Bransdorf in 1822, which a long way from Downham Market. Again, quickly moving on, the key thing that I guess is really sets up most of the bells we've got in our towers now is the Oxford movement, this, this political and religious movement to get back to some of the, what the, what the proponents of it saw as the traditions of, of the Anglo-Catholic church. Um, and that Gothic architecture was the only architecture that was church architecture. And they operated, of course, at a time in the immediate uh, sort of surge of the Industrial Revolution when lots of urban areas needed churches. So they had a strong influence on, um, on, on church design, church construction. But equally, their views sharpened the division which had existed for 150 years between clergy and ringers. Um, so there was chiming for worship and the ringing was secular as we know, and even to the extent that Ellicum designed his famous chiming apparatus for his church at Bitton, so the ringers couldn't ring on a Sunday. Um, he wasn't having it. But ironically, many clergy did learn to ring, either at Oxford or Cambridge, and through their interest in ringing, we began to see ringers being brought into the church as church workers, hence our diocesan associations. Uh, and the Belfry reforms accompanied by at many reforms in bell installations. And sadly, at that time, many ancient bells were recast. Some we know about because the inscriptions were reproduced. Many we've only got from historic records. And a 19th century bell foundry would have looked very much like a 20th century one in many regards. The picture on the bottom left is actually, we believe, from Ruddall's foundry about 1800. You can see a stack of headstocks. You can see a bell on the tuning machine and Abraham Ruddle was the first person to introduce a lathe tuning. The bell um, was fixed and the lathe rotated. These days it's the bell that rotates, but that's just the, the technology that's used. But by then we're getting to the stage where the bell is being made, not with a wax or, or a, a, a clay model, but simply two halves of the bell molded by a strickle, which is, if you like, the the outline of the of the cross section of the bell profile, um, and then the two halves being fitted together. We've now got substantial frames, vertical posts being avoided whenever possible. Although in this example, we've got a couple of gallows ends to allow bells to swing very close to the wall, um, and and the, the 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 timbers of the the braces being mortised into the frame heads at the top and the frame sills at the bottom so that they could be tightened down with tie rods and compressed. And it's very difficult to compress a frame and tighten it down if you've got vertical posts. So bell frames being designed and built by bell frame makers rather than local carpenters. You've got cast iron being introduced. Gillibrands introduced the first cast iron bell frame in Liverpool in the, in the 1840s from memory, although I stand to be corrected on, on the date. Um, and, and we've got all metal frames. Originally, they were composite frames where you had a timber head and sill and, 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 and a metal uh, webbing in between. And we've still got a number of those in, in the diocese. Um, you've got bolted strap work. You've now got proper threaded bolts that can be tightened up. Initially, they would have been hand cut and the nut and the bolt head would have been unique to each other. Um, by the, the middle of the 1800s, the later 1800s, you've got Whitworth and Co. producing standard threads um, and being able to cut standard threads. But as we can see here, lots of experimentation. Um, the issue of how you keep gudgeons in line so that bells revolve, particularly when the two gudgeons are anchored at different ends of the headstock. Uh, one of the solutions was the hoop gudgeon, where you had one long bar with a hoop in the middle to go around the, the cannons, and that kept the whole thing in line and stopped the, the headstock, if the headstock walked, the cannon, the, the gun, the, sorry, the gudgeon stayed in line. But predominantly uh, the, the, these days and, and from the later 1800s are bolted on plate gudgeon, as you can see on the right hand side. Lots of attempts to improve clapper fixings. And even when you needed to turn a bell through 90 degrees to present a new face to the clapper, uh, adaptation so that you could um, hang the clapper to swing in a different direction by bolting a, a, an independent staple through the bell. And lots of experiments with stays and sliders particularly metal peg and hook stays, metal sliders, levers and, and pendulums, 
um, uh, and even latchets with, wood, with wooden stays, but eventually majoring on the, the stay and slide of the timber that we know today and for the reasons that we all understand. In the 19th century, the big four really took over. Um, you've got Whitechapel producing 154 bells that still exist, including 13 rings and chimes up to 1914, Taylor's 135, um, 12 complete rings and chimes, Warner's who began founding in about 1850, um, uh, uh, down to 1915, First World War, 115 bells, nine complete rings and chimes, and Gillett, Gillett and Johnson, Gillett and Bland, Gillett and Co, um, as you can see there, a, a much smaller number of bells, uh, but they didn't start really making bells as clockmakers until church bells rather than clock bells until the 1880s. And again, odd bells from one or two foundries. Llewellyn's and James, perhaps the unusual one. Most Llewellyn's and James bells are considered to be particularly unmusical. Um, but of course, there's the famous ring of six on God, at God's Hill on the Isle of Wight, which are, are excellent Llewellyn's and James bells. So sometimes by accident, they got it right. Um, an interesting bell at Hook, um, up in the northeast of the county from the Gowers foundry, the local Iron Smith, um, and odd bells from different places. Naylor Vickers, the steel bells at Swanmore on the Isle of Wight. Harrington Latham, who specialised in tubular bells, like huge glockenspiels, and I know about two sets of them. And a bell from John Murphy of Dublin, which was cast in, in, in as you can see, in the 1800s, but actually brought into the diocese only about 15 years ago. 20th century, well, we know a lot about the 20th century, but the big shift here was, first of all, to put right the damage of the wars, and secondly, to begin to think about conservation. And even at this speed, I must mention the conservation restorations at Bullington and West Hitherley by Hugh Ray, very much experimenting and demonstrating that historic fabric could be conserved. Um, the foundry looking very much as it does today, as it did in the 1900s, tuning on a five-tone principle introduced on a lathe from the, the 1890s onwards and becoming standard, um, and all the things, the flat top bells that we understand, metal frames, modern fittings, all of the gear that we well understand. 230 bells from Whitechapel after 1914, 237 from Taylor's, and you can see both of them cast 12 rings or chimes, a very small number from Warner's who stopped founding in about 1920. Many more from Gillett and Johnson and this period after the First World War, probably the heyday of Gillett and Johnson included in, in, in terms of tuning. Uh, and you can see that our heaviest bell in the two dioceses, the base bell of the, of the Carillon at, uh, or the chime at the Southampton Civic Centre um, is a product of the Croydon foundry. And some odds and ends and then the short-lived Hayward Mills Associates um, Operation Five Bells, um, Matthew Higby, uh, and very sad that Richard Bowditch died so early in life from cancer, but obviously he collaborated with Higby. It was his foundry at Dullcote where the early Higby and the Bowditch Bells were cast, although I believe Matthew cast in his own factory, there, his own works. But, but if you like, the latest in the generation. Lots of work done post Second World of War, to augment and, and anybody who says, we don't worry about twos. Well, there's the example that in 1985, a chime of two was turned into a ring of six at Eversley. Lots of bells increased in number, um, uh, threes becoming sixes or fives, a couple of fours being augmented and lots of larger rings being created in the last part of the last century and the beginning of this century. And the unusual one at the end, Avington, a prayer book church built in the 1760s, 1770s Georgian church, a ring of six installed in 1776, brought down the tower because the brick tower is incredibly elastic and it moves the whole church when the bells are swinging, even today. The bells became derelict. They were sold for scrap. Um, when I was asked to look at it, there was a small stable bell from Mears hung, it was supposed to be for chiming, but the clapper was actually swinging on the outside of it rather than the inside of it. Conversation, one of the DAC members happened to be a parishioner said, can we do something about it? Out of that came a proposal to install a six bell frame, three second hand bells in 2008, 
two more in 2009 to, to put a ring of five where there'd previously been a ring of six, but a completely different situation. So quite an unusual case there. And just literally to finish last few seconds, sadly, we've lost some important rings by fire. The ring at St. Peter's Yately, a very important heritage ring lost by fire and replaced by a Taylor Octave. More recently, St. Andrew's Timsbury gutted by fire, certainly the West End, and two Mears Bells of 1823 came crashing to the floor. You can see in the middle of the bottom pictures, that's a, an upside down headstock. You can see some of the bolts and a plate gudgeon there exposed because of the intensity of the fire. And the, the, the far right hand picture are bits of one of the bell that came crashing to the floor, one of the two bells. And they've since been replaced by Whitechapel and the church restored. And of course, as we all know, most recently, a, 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 a Gillett and Johnson six from that Gillett and Johnson heyday period. Although interestingly, successes to a ring of five by Samuel Knight. So Gillets weren't afraid to, to cut up relatively historic bells. Um, but obviously the church gutted by fire and there are the five bells, six bells, how it was, five of the six bells hanging rather forlornly in the frame after the fire. Those bells at the moment are with Matthew Higby and uh, I'm not sure I haven't been for a year or so because of lockdown, but when I was last there, we were debating um, the structure to uh, create, effectively create a, a Hampshire dovecot belfry of steel inside the fabric um, that would support the bells. Sorry, that's taken a bit longer than I expected. I've talked too much, but Roger, the discussion is now for you to lead, unless there are any questions. Okay, well, I think um, the first thing we ought to do is you thanks very much for that. I've learned a lot and I'm quite surprised just how many old bells survive. But perhaps for the next few minutes, if people want to ask some questions, I've then got about five minutes at the end, which I just like to lead a separate discussion. So um, any questions, just unmute yourself and um, fire away. I thought at East Wellow, there's a ring of three that's got an old Wokingham and a couple of old Salisbury bells. I thought, is that correct? Or is that some information I got wrong from that document you said? No, that's correct. They are actually hung for ringing, but they're not safe to ring. Um, I don't think there's anybody on the call here at the moment, but <clears throat> about three or four years ago, there were proposals to, to swing chime them. Um, and we did some work and we actually had Alan Frost, who's one of the the leading experts on bell safety. He's a bell advisor for half a dozen dioceses. He's also a leading member of the Central Council Towers and Belfries Committee. And with his benefit and the benefit of a number of uh, cathedral and other ringers from, from the Winchester Diocese, um, one and two and three bells were swung. And what we found was that the whole of that three bell frame, which is actually a long, uh, it's an adapted um, brace king post frame with long heads. The whole thing was sliding backwards and forwards about two or three inches across the supporting timbers. It's not physically anchored down. And there was a bit of a debate about how to anchor it down. Um, I've not heard anything since. Um, uh, parishes are entitled to have other priorities, um, but there are three bells and that's quite right. Um, I can confirm in a second while other people are talking exactly where, the, where they're from, but they're certainly, they're certainly older bells and, and an important ring to be, uh, to, to, to be looked after. Um, yeah, but not, to be, not to be swung at the moment. Uh, well, certainly they, they not are, to be they, run. Some work was done recently. The architect has allowed them to be swung. Yeah, they're, they're swung chimed at the moment. Are they? Yeah. So they've been anchored down, have they? Yeah, yeah. I think we so won't, anyway. There's we won't work, get work into a done. debate about faculties then. <laughs> Actually, the treble was cast or recast by Clement Tozier in Salisbury in 1703. Um, William Tozier cast the second in 1725, also in Salisbury, and the the the, tre the sorry the tenor is a Wokingham bell, quite an early Wokingham bell from about about 1400. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, if there isn't, I'll. There's a question. Claire and Chris. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Phil. That was really fascinating. I was just wondering whether you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I was just wondering whether there's um, there's a book with all this information in. You, 
gave That's a couple of examples. That's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. <laughs> ah, okay. The, the only what? source at the moment of, of printed source is this, which is um, Colchester's Hampshire Bells, oh, yeah. um, and, and that dates to 1920. All right. uh, and there are two spreadsheets, which are not the most up to date. I think Hugh may have be working on his Portsmouth one. I'm slowly working on the on the Winchester one, which are actually produced by George Dawson, another uh, campanologist and bell ringer from Nottingham, on behalf of the Church Buildings Council. And, and as a sort of long term project, we are trying to bring our own knowledge into those and update them. And the Church Ca Church Buildings Council will have a, a central record of as much as is known, mm -hmm. but it will be spreadsheets. It won't be written down in the way that, that perhaps we've described here. So the interpretation won't be there. Okay, thank you. And I was just I was just wondering actually whether whether there's records of bells that have been lost to the county that have gone elsewhere. We will we will know about bells which have been transferred out of the county um, and reused through the Celtic Trust or through other sources. I say we will, we will know about most of them. There will be some bells that were transferred before Celtic got in Celtic got involved in this whole bell brokerage system that we won't know. There are uh, one of the bells or possibly two of the bells from St. Peter's Chesil in Winchester, uh, Chesil Street in Winchester. We're not absolutely sure where they've gone. There's a suggestion one went to Port Harcourt in West Africa uh, to a, a mission church. We know about the bell that's at um, St. Matthew's, sorry, St. Pe uh, St. Peter's in Week, the, the modern church in Week, um, but we don't know about one of the others. Um, but if Caltech have been involved, we do know. For example, we know that the Llewellyn's treble at at Houghton, which was going to go to become a bell at Northington as part of the Houghton and then the Northington restorations, um, in the end wasn't suitable. It was too small and it was too poor in tone and that's been scrapped. Mm. So we know that because it, the value of the metal was traded in by uh, by, by the parish to um, and by Celtic to procure another bell that, that in, ended up in Northington. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just share my screen for five minutes and tell you a bit about this possible project. So just a moment. It was here a minute ago. Oh, can't find it perhaps. Just bear with me a few seconds. No, I can't minimise my Zoom screen. Well, Roger's looking at, I've just noted, looked at my clock and I realise that I rove around my time considerably. I apologise and thank okay. you for your patience while I carry no, on. No, no, no. Um, just me try sharing my screen again because it's there somewhere. Zoom, Zoom. Oh, show all windows. Um. <laughs> Scroll down. It wasn't showing me all my windows. There it is. Right. Can you see that? Yes? Yeah. Good. OK. Um, this is, I'm doing a bit of fishing, if you like. I'm seeing if we can catch one or two people's interest. It's just a, an idea for a potential history project. So, um, the Guild was founded almost 150 years ago. In eight years' time, it's going to be the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Guild. So it's eight years away. Um, what Phil hasn't mentioned is that about just over 20 years ago, the Guild started a survey of the bells and frames in, the, in Hampshire, the two dioceses, and those results are on the Guild website but the, the survey is only roughly 50% complete. Um, that survey was carried out using paper survey forms. But my experience, obviously some of you know I'm a, a surveyor and I've been involved in doing lots of surveys of buildings using digital technology. And um, what you can do nowadays is rather than use paper survey forms, um, a lot of professional surveys are undertaken using electronic technology. So smartphones would enable us to undertake a, a new survey or 
refresh the existing survey, but in a different and hopefully much more convenient way. Alan Yalden, who's the vice master of the Guild, has also been talking about a project to compile a library of sound recordings of the bells in the diocese and another project to compile a library of photographs of peel boards. Um, sorry, and in terms of producing a book to mark the anniversary, things like Amazon nowadays, you can do print on demand, sort of Simon Gay um, has recently produced a handbell book and you just, as you want a copy, you just apply to Amazon and they print it for you and, and it arrives within a few days. So we don't have to produce a book and print hundreds or thousands of copies, we can leave that to Amazon to do. Just talking about sound recordings, um, this, if you look on YouTube, you'll find quite a lot of um, YouTube recordings already. I mean, this is one lasting nine minutes of some ringing at Portsmouth Cathedral. You can also see the peel boards there in the background. Um, and in fact, um, my sources tell me that are roughly 50% of the towers in the country already have YouTube videos posted on YouTube. So assembling a collection of sound recordings is not technically and practically going to be that difficult. Uh, the only issue is going to be that, as, as Alan has said, is that um, we don't want to have uh, a huge amount of storage space. So he's looking for two or three minutes in MP4 format for the, those of you that are technically minded. And with obviously smartphones and modern technology, you can take a photograph of the peel forward in the tower and it's possible technically to upload that to a website at the same time. So you can do it there and then. The only problem with that is I'm sure that the quality of the photographs will vary. So it will need somebody to curate the collection uh, and obviously weed out the ones that are not good enough and uh, or up to standard and get them retaken. Uh, that's a photograph that I've taken of a peel board in uh, St John's Alsford and it's one of the early peels, in fact it was the first peel on the bells and a peel is what we believe was rung by a local band at the time and there's lots of those around which we'd like to uh, research and find out more about and if we've got them available electronically that will make the re subsequent research a lot easier. Bells and fittings, again we can set up a survey form electronically and collect it. Um, one of the IT gurus that we've got in the Guild, Simon Poiser, has suggested we could even go as far as doing a 360 degree virtual tour of the historic installations. And uh, if estate agents can do that for house uh, sales in um, lockdown, I'm sure we could do it. And from what I understand, I'm not really a technical guru, but I think some smartphones actually allow you to do this more or less free of charge anyway. You don't need to buy necessarily an expensive camera. Dove has already got a lot of detail in electronic format and um, Link Dick and Love and his team uh, have all actually been expanding that. So we don't necessarily need to duplicate that information. And as a professional surveyor, I would warn against the dangers of um, duplicating information because errors can creep in. Um, the only thing that Dove doesn't have, or one of the things that Dove doesn't have is inscriptions. And obviously there's the, the book that was produced in the 1920s that's got the inscriptions but some of those bells no longer exist and quite a few bells have been added since. Um, and what we would need to do is just spend a little bit of time training the surveyors who are gonna go out and do this work just to maintain a consistency. Just looking at Dove, this is one of the rings in the guild um, and what's already on there. So you can see that the weight, the frequency of the nominal, the diameter, the date, Obviously, you can see, I think this is, um, I can't remember the name of the tower now. Um, it's one of the ones in the Alton district. There's a couple of Roger Landon bells there. Hawkley, I think, is it? It's Hawkley, isn't it? And a Brian Eldridge bell there as well. So you can see there 
quite a bit of detail, whether it's got cannons, whether it's been quarter turned or not, or eighth turned is there as well. Um, also details of the frame, when it was put in, what it's made of. There's other information about when it was last overhauled and by whom. Um, the only thing there that's missing is truss type and layout. And I've been in touch with Tim Jackson, who's one of the other people at the team on the Dove team. And what they are keen to do is to collect that information about the trust and the layout. Um, the original paper surveys, people were asked to sketch them. But what Chris Pickford has produced, he's produced a whole classification system. So these are just a few pages of it. So if I just go back where it says truss type and layout, we just put the type. Um, there's obviously quite a few more different types there, but it's quite a quick and neat way of recording the information. And obviously what you can do to supplement this is you can obviously take some photographs which you can upload to the sur electronic survey as well, just to add a complete record. So um, one of the things that the Heritage Lottery Fund do, and I think other sources of funding are available. If we were to take on a project like this, we can actually obtain some funding to help with it if we need to buy any specialist equipment or, or uh, do any particular work. But it's something a lot of heritage groups are quite keen on. Um, and I think Alan's already talked to the local heritage people about placing a copy of his sound recordings and peelboard photographs in the Hampshire archive. And one of the other things is that um, we may lose some of our existing rings of bells post COVID. It won't necessarily happen straight away, but there's obviously going to be quite a financial pressure on the church and the diocese after COVID. And there's a distinct possibility that one or two, possibly more of our existing rings of bells may go into the CCT or the churches may close and the bells might have to be, the church is sold and the, the bells might have to be removed. So it's important to maintain that historical record. Um, obviously the other thing that Phil highlighted in his talk was the, the number of fires as well. I think Phil explained that it was very useful that there was a survey of the Rockley bells had actually been undertaken and that was helpful with dismantling the bells after the fire. Um, Kathy, my wife's also got an interest in podcasting. Uh, you've probably heard some of her fun with bells podcasts, but she's also been approached by the Hampshire History Trust to organise Winchester Heritage Open Days to do a podcast by them on the history of bells in Hampshire. And I think bells and bell ringing in Hampshire. Sure. Um, so I'm um, very keen to, to talk to um to phil um and to, you and you <laughs> to to um interview you for the podcast if that's possible okay so that and i think that that's that's something that's important that obviously in terms of ringers we need to go out there so um and engage with new new people because we need more ringers or we will do after covid so the final bit can you help um, we, we, there's a whole range of, of uh, people that we'd need to uh, bring in to help with this. There's people with knowledge of IT, web design, digital photography, obviously people like Phil with, and uh, Hugh with the knowledge of history and heritage. There's obviously chapters we can include on bell foundering and where all the bells come from. And thanks, Phil, there's a huge amount that you've got there already. Um, obviously people with an interest in architecture, engineering or surveying to go out and actually do the surveys or resurveys the towers. Um, PR and comms and also people who are prepared to go out and do public speaking. I think the talk that we've given today has got a much wider audience um, than the bell ringing or bell ringers. There, there are a lot of other people who would be interested and people who might be interested in helping with fundraising. So uh, if you'd like to help, do send me uh, or Phil or anybody um, can, can, can volunteer and we'll, we'll have a chat with you and see whether it's feasible to proceed 
with this idea? We've got eight years, we've got plenty of time, but there's quite a lot of work that will be involved. Just a plug, um, we've got another webinar in a fortnight's time, which Matt Lawrence is going to deliver, um, and that's on recruitment and retention. We've done a survey in the Winchester district of things that people are most concerned about and recruitment and retention after the pa pandemic is by far the thing that's got the most concern. So hopefully that's the right timing for that, especially as we hopefully are going to be able to return to our towers, perhaps in May and certainly hopefully in June onwards. And thanks for coming. So if anybody's got any more questions, uh, I'll stop the sharing there. And so I'm sure Phil and Hugh and any and Kathy and I and perhaps Martin can answer any more questions that you've got. Uh, just just a thing about Colchester with the inscriptions that we found that the inscriptions that he'd written in his book were not correct. So I think it's just an example of you need to go back to primary sources in any research. Can I just add that Colchester didn't actually do all the research himself for his book. He was the editor. Yes. A lot of his material came from parishes and from clergy. So if the yeah, source got it wrong, <laughs> he got it wrong. But his, he, was, he was rector of St John's New Alsford and he got our inscriptions wrong. <laughs> you, you may say that, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> well, we did, we did um, uh, rubbings of them and carefully did them and it, uh, we thought, no, it's, it's not, not right. So, uh, yeah. But obviously, with digital technology these days, you can <laughs> either take a digital photograph or you can take a rubbing and take it home and scan it or photograph the rubbing you know so it is possible with with the latest technology to, to get it pretty accurate it'll be the proofreaders that um don't uh, where any errors creep in no more questions well it's uh, gone half past 11 so Thanks very much, Phil, and everybody for attending. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you in a fortnight's time. Is is Alan trying to say something? Jonathan, you've got your hand up. Unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, it was um, it was the applause icon. <laughs> <laughs> so Alan's applause as well. OK, thanks very much indeed. All right. I think I'll... we should all give applause. That was fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank Appreciate you. that. Okay. Very kind of you. Thanks for okay. Thanks for volunteering. Thank <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks then. Bye. 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 Bye.